First entering service in 1981, NASA's fleet of five space shuttles flew into orbit and came back to Earth again more than 130 times. It was uh, the first winged vehicle to fly back from space hypersonically. It carried more people than any other space vehicle. It was revolutionary in so many ways. Racking up over 537 million miles in space, for three decades, the shuttles were the workhorses of the American space program. The shuttle is so capable of what it's designed to do. It really is. It's a fantastic achievement. Built 50 years ago, the technology behind the shuttle's return trips to space is still one of man's greatest feats of engineering. T minus one minute and counting. Bolted to a huge orange fuel tank and two of the largest solid rocket boosters ever built, the shuttle goes through its final checks before launch. Liquid hydrogen tank is at flight pressure. The only people within a three-mile radius of the shuttle are the astronauts inside. There's a lot of things that can go wrong during a launch. If sitting on top of a few million pounds of high explosives is going to cause you emotional stress, you're in the wrong profession. Eighty-five percent of the shuttle's 2,000-ton weight is fuel. And it's going to use the explosive power of all of it to get into space. Rocketry is controlled explosions. You hope that it keeps you going in the right direction. T-minus 20 seconds and counting. Main engines prepare for ignition. T-minus 10, 9. We don't hear a countdown like the, the public do. But we can see on our computer monitor a little clock going tick, tick, tick. Eight, seven. 6.6 .6 seconds before liftoff, we get ready to ignite the main engines. We've gone for main engine start. Out the window, you see this bright yellow glow. Three, two, one. And you go, oh, here we go. Liftoff of America's space shuttle. All that explosive power shoves us in the back, and it's a very violent shove. It feels like someone has kind of taken their foot and kicked you in the hindquarters. With all its engines blazing, the shuttle produces enough energy to light Britain for a day. It's a very visceral experience. You know you are going somewhere very, very fast, and you have very little control over it. Two minutes in, 28 miles high, the shuttle hits 3,000 miles per hour, and its reusable boosters are jettisoned. At the moment, we're going about Mark 4. That's four times the speed of sound. And the, the sky goes from clouds and blue sky to black sky. The shuttle's main engines now propel it even faster through the upper reaches of the atmosphere. We're going to use up all the fuel to get up to Mark 25, 25 times the speed of sound. And that's the speed we need to keep going around the Earth and never actually come back to it. Once the shuttle reaches 17,500 miles per hour, Thanks to the laws of physics, it could continue to orbit Earth indefinitely. Explosive bolts detonate and release the empty fuel tank. That's it. We're weightless. Your pen floats, dust particles float. You're sort of looking around, thinking, are we there yet? <laughs> it took just eight and a half minutes to get the shuttle into space. There's usually a cheer from the crew about that point <laughs> because the, the most stressed part of the, the mission, the, the ascent, is over. In orbit, the versatile shuttles would be able to do more than any other spaceship 
before or since. We could fit one and a half Greyhound buses inside the cargo bay. That's how big that vehicle is. It was capable of carrying huge satellites up into orbit, constructing the International Space Station, and that's what made it such a productive program. With room for eight astronauts, the shuttles could take more people into space than ever before. The shuttle has opened up space flight to a much wider variety of people, scientists, engineers, medical doctors. We really learned a lot about uh, how to do science in space. But what made the shuttles truly groundbreaking was how they came back to Earth. You are go or deorbit burn. Traveling nine times faster than a bullet, the shuttle hits Earth's atmosphere. We create a shock wave that has a temperature of 9,000 degrees. And so it makes the air look like it's on fire. You're flying into a blowtorch. Friction from the air generates so much heat, the shuttle starts to glow. You look outside and it's red. It's just a, a terribly hot surface. The temperature of the shuttle's heat-proof skin reaches 1,650 degrees centigrade, almost four times the melting point of its metal airframe. You see drips going along the, the, the windows, and it looks like rain, it looks like water, but it's something melted. Relying solely on air friction to slow it down, it takes the shuttle 30 minutes flying time to reach its landing site. Columbia, you're going subsonic now, looking good. Having used all its fuel in space, pilots are depending on the shuttle's wings to glide it home. It was a great big 115-ton brick that doesn't have any engines. And so you get exactly one chance to land it. Five, four, three, two, one, down. Hitting the tarmac at 226 miles per hour, much faster than any plane. The shuttle's parachutes are deployed to bring it to a halt. I thought, oh, holy cow, we built this thing, and we find a way to get this into space and come back and land like an airplane, wheels on a runway. That's a heck of an accomplishment. But this accomplishment came at a price. Over their three decades in service, the shuttles cost an eye-watering $209 billion. Yet when they were first proposed in the late 1960s, the space shuttles were meant to be a cost-effective successor to the most expensive space program in history. At the start of the decade, NASA had been set the challenge of inventing new spacesuits, computers, and rockets for an audacious mission. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing not because they are easy, but because they are hard. With the Cold War raging, President Kennedy had another motive for sending men to the moon. Kennedy was not particularly interested in space or going to the moon. He was interested in beating the Russians at something. To achieve this, Kennedy gave NASA an unlimited budget. We pretty much had a blank check. You just said, this is what I need to get this job done, and, and you got it. On the 20th of July, 1969, the US won the race to the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But getting men to the moon had cost the Earth. The final bill for American taxpayers had been more than $25 billion. If you turn that into today's dollars, you're probably talking half a trillion. It was an extremely expensive program because we threw away the rocket every time we used it. The only thing that you got back was this little capsule on the very top, and even that was not reusable. 